Hello, welcome back to my channel. This is actually the second time that I'm filming or attempting to film this video. Last time I got like three quarters of the way done and my SD card filled up. So we're trying this again and I'm gonna tell you about all of the books that I have never talked to you guys about or mostly haven't talked about. I did this one other time for the last three months of 2020 and now I'm back to do it for the beginning of 2021. These books that I'm gonna tell you about are books that I didn't vlog and therefore would have no other reason to talk to you about them. But I don't want them to just like completely disappear and me never, you know, kind of tell you my thoughts and feelings. So that's what I'm going to do. That's what I use wrap ups for. So I'm going to talk to you guys about 13 books that we've never talked about. Let's get into it. I broke it down last time into categories. I thought that made it everything a little neater and cleaner. I'm going to do that again this time. The first category, I guess you could say, is young adult contemporary. And I've actually, I think, only read one YA contemporary this year, but not just that I haven't talked to you about, I mean like total. But the one YA contemporary that I've read so far this year is Watch Over Me by Nina LaCour. This is actually the first book that I read in total this year, like it was the first book that I finished, and I picked this up on the recommendation of Kayla from Books and Lala. I feel kind of neutral about this book. I give it three stars. It is about our main character Mila as she kind of navigates the trauma that she had as a kid in this new setting. So after she graduates high school, she ends up getting her first job, and she is going to be a tutor at this sort of group home almost. She goes and lives, I believe, in Northern California, and she gets paid just a little bit, but mostly gets paid in, like, free rent, and she gets to stay on this, like, beautiful property and tutor this one little boy. The story is about her connecting with him, helping him work through his trauma, her working through her trauma as a result of helping him, and also her kind of developing friendships and relationships, kind of for the first time, outside of the ones that she has been traumatized by. I found this story fine. I think my issue with it was the way that it was told. It was definitely very lyrical, beautiful, the setting was really nice, but there was something about it that just kind of put up a wall for me. I couldn't connect with Mila, our main character, and a lot of the story felt a little bit, I don't want to say too metaphorical for me, I just couldn't really connect with what Mila was going through, and I don't feel like I ever really learned what she did go through. So this was just okay for me. I don't know if I'll pick up any Nina Lucour in the future. If you have read any of her books before, let me know in the comments like which ones I should pick up. This wasn't terrible, I, I did appreciate the way it was written, but I think there was just something there that made it to where I couldn't connect to the main character, and since it's a YA contemporary, if you can't connect with the characters, like, you probably can't connect with the story. So, moving on to a different category, uh, I also read a couple of nonfiction books, which I think is interesting because I don't read a whole lot of nonfiction in total. I need to go back and look at what I read last year. I never really put together my statistics on, you know, what I read and how many of what genre, but I don't think I read many nonfiction, so it's interesting to me that I read two in the first three months of the year. That was a long-winded way of saying, let's talk about some nonfiction. Uh, the first one that I read was Disfigured by Amanda Leduc, Leduc, not quite sure how to say her last name, but I enjoyed this. I think the only real thing that I can say about this is that I think I should have read some more kind of like introductory works for disability, disability history and education, I guess, before I went into this. This book particularly is about Amanda's experience growing up disabled and also her experience with fairy tales and how they represent disabled people. And I felt like it was really great. I actually really, really liked the memoir components of this. I think what I didn't love was that it didn't, it didn't feel introductory in a lot of ways. And I do feel like there was a lot of repetition in terms of the fairy tale aspects. I think a lot of her critiques of fairy tales were good, but I think after the first critique, a lot of the other critiques she had kind of all felt the same. And that could just be me not understanding maybe exactly what she was trying to convey. That's probably what it was. I'm not super great with nonfiction, to be honest, in terms of like truly picking up every little little piece. And this to me read a little bit like an article that you would read for school because she had kind of a thesis, what she was trying to like set out to prove. So I think there might've been some things that maybe I was missing, but I definitely think this was interesting. I hadn't really considered the fact that we treat disability so, so shitty, especially when it comes to, you know, its representation in fairy tales and media, especially media that we show to children. So I did appreciate that aspect, but again, I wish I had read maybe some more introductory or like historical texts about uh, disability before I had gone into this one. So good book, I would recommend, but I don't know if it would be the first book I'd recommend about disability. So moving on, the next nonfiction book that I read, it's funny too, because I think all three of these books were kind of influenced by Kayla in some way. Watch Over Me, it was like a direct recommendation, Disfigured as well. This book I read because because Kayla was doing a video based on like Enneagram types. She's an Enneagram eight wing seven, just like me. And she said that a lot of the recommendations for books to read were Brene Brown books. And I never read Brene Brown. Kayla didn't actually read any Brene Brown in that video, I believe. But I decided to pick up some Brene Brown because she does this sort of like self-help thing. And to be honest, in February, I needed to help myself. So I decided to pick a Brene Brown book up 
about how many times can I say Brene Brown? It just sounds fun, rolls off the tongue. Uh, but I picked up Rising Strong, which is an audiobook, and I believe it is, it's not even a true audiobook. It is an audio recording of a lecture that she gave, and I thought it was fine. The whole point of Rising Strong is to kind of, I guess, tell you how to handle failure and like feelings of disappointment and how people who have experienced this and like grown from it, like how they can teach us something, I guess. My issue, I think, with this was that there were a lot of stories about Brene personally and, like, the experiences she'd been through and her kind of trying to grapple with failure herself, which I found nice. Like, it, it felt good to listen to her stories and it felt inspiring, but I personally wanted something a little bit more prescriptive because when you say that this is going to be something about people who have failed, gotten up, and, like, been successful, I want to see kind of some actionable steps I can take to be more like these people. I never really felt like I got that from this, even though there was, like, a Q&A session and someone specifically asked, like, what are the actionable steps. I didn't feel like she really gave any, so that was a little frustrating, although I do feel like the overall tone and message of the story was great. Not even story, it's like nonfiction, but the overall tone and message of what she was trying to say was great. I just feel like there was something missing there for me. And again, it could just be because this was a lecture and not like a really well thought out um, book, but I don't know. I felt kind of neutral about it. I don't rate nonfiction. I'd probably rate this three stars though if I did rate nonfiction, um, but I would be interested to pick up more Brene Brown in the future. I think her narrative style is one that I really enjoy. I think she has like a lot of <laughs> sarcasm and cynicism that I can relate to. I feel like a lot of self-help and nonfiction can be a little bit cheesy. This didn't feel like that, but again, it didn't give me everything I was looking for. So that's it with the nonfiction. <laughs> I only read two books in that category and I don't know, I had a pretty good time. Definitely makes me want to pick up more nonfiction. I think these are two of the nonfiction books that I've enjoyed more than a lot of my other ones. So that's always good. But next up, let's talk about the one mystery thriller that I've read this year. Um, I read some other mystery thrillers for a video, but I actually think that the last one I finished in December. Anyway, the one mystery thriller I have to talk to you guys about is The Wife Upstairs by Rachel Hawkins. This was a really fun thriller, I'm not gonna lie. It was about our main character, Jane, who goes to the Deep South. Um, she's had kind of a shitty life, shitty past. We don't know much about it except for she is trying to kind of change her life. She's living with a guy who she knew from way back when. He's kind of gross too. And to kind of escape even the life she's living now, she decides she's going to walk dogs in this like exclusive, rich little neighborhood. She meets a ton of people. She she dog walks and she runs into this guy named Eddie one time when she dog walks and slowly but surely she's able to weasel her way into kind of the upper echelon of this little society, this little neighborhood. I think it's set in Georgia and it's just fascinating to watch. I really like Jane and her motivations and trying to kind of discern if the things that she's doing are done with the best of intentions. I liked that a lot. And then also figuring out the kind of some mysteries and secrets of Eddie because Eddie's wife has recently gone missing and or could potentially be dead. Her name is B. She was someone who made a really big impact on all of the people around her. So a lot of the interactions that Jane is having with people are based on their reactions and their relationship with B. So it's interesting hearing about B through everybody's different perspectives, figuring out more about B as the story goes on, and also figuring out that Eddie and Jane might not necessarily be who we think they are. So it's very twisty and very thrilling the entire time. I loved the way that mental health was handled as well. It was very subtle, which I appreciated. I think so often with like a more psychological style thriller, we get kind of this like unhinged woman who I personally don't always connect with. Sometimes I think it can go into, oh, she's going crazy because, you know, this guy betrayed her. And I think that can be frustrating. In this, it's not like that at all. We have a few very calculating women who go after what they want, and I think it was fun to read about, so I really liked this. I will say it's not as layered as some of the other thrillers that I enjoy, which is why I didn't give it five stars and why I probably wouldn't reread this, but it is one that I wouldn't hesitate to recommend. So if you're looking for a good thriller to pick up, this is a good one. Next up, we can talk about some romance. I read a lot of romance. Most of what I'm going to talk to you about next, not most of, all of what I'm going to talk to you about next is romance. First up in the category of paranormal slash urban fantasy romance. I only have one book to talk to you about, but it was an interesting one, and that is Archangel's Shadows by Nalini Singh. I have a complicated history with the Guild Hunter series. I can't remember what number this book is, but I know it's not like the first or second book in the series. I've read quite a few of them, and this particular story is about Ashwini and Janvier, who we've met in previous books. I kind of feel mixed about this one. I feel like I wanted to love the story more than I do. I feel like it was trying to tell you that these two characters had a lot of like baked in history, and I didn't really feel like that was conveyed very well, and I also feel like the romance was just kind of like 
so-so. And I would be willing to overlook that like I have in pretty much all of the previous books, except for the fact that the plot of this one was very weak. It was kind of a whodunit. Ashwini and John Vier team up to figure out who has been killing people around uh, New York. I think it's New York. I don't know. They might have like traveled, but they end up trying to find out who, who killed all of these people. And the whodunit aspect is pretty lame because almost immediately we kind of know who it is. It's like the first suspect that we're introduced to. I don't know. That really made this book kind of blah for me because the, here's the thing. I appreciate realism and I appreciate happy for now. I feel like that is pre pretty realistic for a lot of people, right? You don't necessarily start dating, you know, the first person you meet and then like fall madly in love and that's your person, right? But I think I prefer like a faded mate's intense over-the-top attraction whenever I'm reading paranormal and urban fantasy. So whenever I pick up an Alimi Singh book, I'm sort of disappointed when the characters grow to like each other, they kind of like fall in love near the end of the book and that's it. You know, there's no marriage, there's no engagement, and I know that's very like heteronormative and over-the-top and that like doesn't need to happen in every story, but when it comes to paranormal and urban fantasy, that's something that I just come to expect. So I don't know, this book was just okay, the plot was just okay, the character relationship was just okay, the romance was just okay, it was just whatever. It's kind of made me consider whether or not I want to continue on with the series because I felt this way about most of the books. I think the plot was interesting in more of the other books, but I've never really loved any of the couples that I've read. So it kind of leaves me thinking like, if the whole point of the series is romance, are these books that I want to continue to pick up when there's other paranormal series out there that I could give a chance and maybe like really fall in love with the couples? So I don't know. I'm on the fence about this. Maybe the other books get better. Let me know if you've read these, you know, if I should carry on <laughs> or if I should maybe try the Psy Changeling series. I think I tried to read the first book in that series and didn't love it, but I've heard a lot of good Thing, so maybe I'll give those a try instead. Next we can move on to the bulk of what I read and that is contemporary romance which is very unsurprising I'm sure. Most of these books I am reading for a list video that's coming out in August but I didn't want to wait until August to tell you about them so I'm going to talk to you about some of them. Um, some of them I just picked up on my own and I'll, I'll let you know what's what. But the first book I picked up was one that I just picked up on a whim and it was The Princess Trap by Talia Hibbert. This one was another just kind of like middle of the road book for me. I think it's because you can definitely see the progression of Talia Hibbert's writing as you read her stuff. Uh, the Brown Sisters books are obviously, in my opinion, like the culmination of her writing, like just top tier amazing stuff. And this book, while it wasn't bad by any means, I think it lacked some of the development that I've seen Talia Hibbert kind of display. And by development, I mean character development. This book is about Cherry and Reuben, and it is a kind of royalty romance. Cherry meets Reuben at her place of work. They kind of have a steamy interaction. They end up making out outside of her office building, and Reuben is caught by the press. So he has to propose to her and have some sort of like fake engagement because he can't be caught in a compromising situation. The premise itself is fine, but I think what was lacking for me was the fact that when they get together, it's based purely on the fact that they've like had a steamy makeout, almost sex scene kind of situation. I wish that we had seen them kind of interact a little bit more, have a little bit more, not even a slow burn romance, but have a little bit more development in the relationship before they go into fake dating or fake engagement. For me, it felt like the only real thing they had going for them was that they were so um, just carnally attracted to each other and that just rarely works for me. I need there to be some sort of like soul connection, mental connection, whatever, intellectual connection I guess, and that just wasn't super present here. So it was just okay for me. I gave this book three stars. The steamy scenes were really good and I think that patented Talia Hibbert humor and like snark is definitely present, but I think if you're looking for like the best of the best, obviously the Brown Sisters books are the way to go. This is obviously like not impacted my uh, desire to read more Talia Hibbert in the future, but this just wasn't my favorite. So carrying on, the next book I read is actually for a list video coming up and it is a new release called Makeup Breakup by Lily Manon. Lily Manon is actually the pen name for Sandhya Manon who writes mostly YA and this is her first foray into adult contemporary romance specifically. I didn't like this. Like, I, I very much didn't enjoy this, and it makes me really sad because I was interested to see how her writing would be different, kind of in an adult setting. And sadly, I think my main complaint is that I felt like this was YA feeling kind of immature, but with sex scenes. So the story actually is kind of like when Dibble met Rishi. We have Annika and Hudson. They both have their own apps and they met at a conference and were led to believe that they had some sort of like very, I don't know, whirlwind romance at this conference. And then he basically ghosted her. That's kind of like the vibe that we're getting. Annika's goal is to have this app called Makeup, which is an app to help couples communicate better. And Hudson has an app that is almost the antithesis of Makeup. It is an app that you can use to break up with your significant other. So they kind of butt heads. They end up like working in the same office building, kind of on a whim, randomly. I don't know. Coincidentally, that's the word I'm looking for. Coincidentally, they work in the same building. They're kind of butting heads, even though you can tell that Hudson's kind of into Annika. Annika's just like, he's the worst. I just... 
I don't know. The interactions that Annika and Hudson had throughout the story I felt were so immature. I felt like this built-in history that they were supposed to have was not at all convincing and it was very clear to me from the beginning why she had animosity towards him. Like we find out later on in the book like exactly what happened and you can tell from day one like why things unfolded the way they did. And I felt like the uh, pining that Hudson was displaying was not something that I cared for. So overall, this was just really not it for me. And it makes me sad because I wanted to, you know, give Sandia Manon another try since I didn't enjoy her her YA that I tried. But um, yeah, I don't know if she's an author that I'm going to read more from in the future. The next book is another one that I read for that list video that's coming in August. And it is also one that I have discussed before, but not like in any great detail. So I thought I would talk about it again here. And it is Twice Shy by Sarah Hogel. Now, I didn't have the best luck with her first novel. I think it was You Deserve Each Other, but I was really curious to see what she was going to put on next because there were hints of greatness in that first one. And this one, I think, just took all of the good components of her writing from that first book and made this one perfect. I don't know. It was so, so good. Gave this book five stars. It's about our main character, Mabel, 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 and Wesley. And Mabel basically inherits a property from her aunt who's recently passed away. And she ends up going to this property, kind of trying to figure out what to do with it. It. And when she's there, she figures out that she's actually not the sole inheritor of this property. She has to share it with a guy named Wesley. And Wesley has very different ideas of what he wants to do with the property, and he is not great at communicating those. At the beginning, we see Wesley as a kind of two-dimensional and flat character, and I was a little bit worried going in that this wasn't going to work for me for that reason. That was the main complaint I had about her debut novel, was that the male main character, while he seemed interesting, we never got enough time with him, and we never got his point of view, so we weren't able to really see how he was feeling about situations. And while we don't get the point of view of Wesley in this book, we really get a better understanding of him as a character as the story kind of unfolds. There is a really pivotal scene, I would say, at like the 40% mark, and we instantly are given insight into Wesley's character in a way that we weren't with the hero in that other book. So love him as a character. He was sweet. He was soft. Really good anxiety rep. I loved the way that the two characters supported each other. And I felt like this was one of those examples of a really good puzzle piece romance where they just fit together perfectly and complemented each other in so many different ways, even though their personalities were so, so different. So I love this book. You have to pick it up when it comes out. I think it comes out in like a week or two. Maybe it comes out this Tuesday. I don't really know. But when it does come out, you have to pick this one up. So these next two books that I'm going to talk about, much like Twice Shy, are for that August list video that I'm doing and they're also books that I've recommended for other recommendation videos but I thought they like bared repeating here since I'm not going to talk about them again until August. So the first book is The X Talk by Rachel Lynn Solomon. I think that's her name. The picture's right here so you can kind of determine that but this is one that I feel kind of bad about because I know Noelle, uh, Noelle Gallagher picked this book up on my recommendation and she didn't love it. She gave it I think three stars just like I did but I feel like in my recommendation video I kind of talked about all of the good points and none of the bad of this book and I'm here to do that now. I think that's part of why I wanted to talk about these books because just because I recommend a book doesn't mean it was like my perfect read. So I want to tell you how I really feel about this book. So um, this was about Shay and Dominic and they are working at a radio station. Shay has been there for kind of a while. She's like 30 now and she's pretty successful. She is the director of her own radio show. She's not like a host. She's just a director and she has her own home and she's just, she's successful. She's doing her thing, but she feels lonely because she feels like she has a lot of love to give, but she's not had a lot of success in kind of romantic relationships. And Dominic, Dominic comes into this radio station as a sort of hotshot recent grad, and he kind of rubs Shay the wrong way. But after some kind of uh, poor, not poor financial decisions, after some like poor finance kind of stuff happens at the radio station, Shay's show gets cut, and her and Dominic have to come up with a show that is going to kind of save the radio station. So she has this idea that if they pretend to be exes, they can have this kind of like podcast slash radio show where they give relationship advice, and that's sort of how the story is set up. They have to really Really pretend to be exes and make it convincing to people in order to kind of sell the story. And it was a fun book. It's one that I recommended based on Beach Read because I really feel like they have a similar kind of tone and relationship dynamic situation going on there, but they were both three-star reads for me. And I think a lot of that comes down to the heroine. I think Shay and I can't remember January in Beach Read, they just have this similar sort of like, I don't want to say hateful or angry personality, but they kind of have this woe is me situation going on that's kind of hard to sympathize with. So I think that's why I recommended them based on each other. I think I said it in like a nicer way in my recommendation video, but they have kind of a similar vibe going on. And even though I think the heroes are really nice and very respectful, I just feel like the relationships are just kind of like, whatever. I wanted to like this so much more than I did. And now that I'm trying to articulate exactly what didn't 100% work about this book for me, 
I'm kind of drawing blanks. Like there wasn't anything just absolutely terrible, but I really think that Shay impacted my enjoyment of this book. I understand where she was coming from. She has a lot of love to give, but I don't know. I just feel like she could have done a little bit more introspection and maybe thought about the fact that like she's coming on a little too strong at first. But this book was just three stars for me. And I wanted to, to get on here and tell you that because I feel like I kind of misled some of you in my recommendation video. But with recommendations, I try to give recommendations based on what I think other people will like. And I know that I am like very picky with romance, so. Anyway, that's the X talk. That's how I feel about it. It was fine, but I know a lot of people will probably enjoy it. So take my kind of neutral opinion with a grain of salt. Okay, now that I'm looking at this list, the next three books are also part of that list video. So I'm not going to say it anymore, but these are ones that I've never talked to you about and they are interesting. So first up, we have Much Ado About You by Samantha Young. And this is one that I read horrible initial reviews of from my friends. No one seemed to like this book. And I think I have like a differing opinion on this one. I think I am going to be the odd man out and say that I liked this. I think you have to go in with certain expectations or lack thereof for this book because it definitely has you suspending your disbelief for a lot of it. It's about our main character, Evie, who goes to England to kind of run away from her real life. I honestly can't remember exactly why she's running away. I think maybe she got dumped by a long-term boyfriend or something, and she's just looking to figure out what the next steps are in her life. Actually, no, it's a job-related thing. That's why she ends up leaving the U.S., but she is able to go to Northern England, I believe, and work in a bookstore, and she gets to kind of run the bookstore itself. She has free rent. It seems like a very much too-good-to-be-true situation, and if that is something that sounds like you wouldn't be able to kind of, like, suspend your disbelief for, this is probably not a book for you because the rest of the book kind of carries on in the same way. So Evie, kind of runs into this dog at one point and she meets his owner and they kind of start falling for each other. And the story really is just about Evie kind of figuring out what she wants out of life, like what her goals and aspirations are, what she wants as her next career step. She kind of solves some of the townspeople's problems along the way, which is so cheesy, but like kind of cute at the same time. And she falls for Roan, I believe his name is, and um, gets close to his niece and helps his niece out. And I don't know, it's just a good story. I liked it. I thought it was very atmospheric and this is definitely something I could see someone picking up in the summer at the pool at the beach whatever and just really sinking your teeth into it's not exactly um highbrow literature. It's not the best romance I've ever read, but I think the relationship was very well built. I feel like there weren't any steamy scenes too early on in the book, and I think if you are a book lover and you like something that's kind of like kitschy and quirky and silly, I think you're gonna like this. Most of the reviews I read were from like my very cynical friends who were like, this is a little hard to believe, and I totally get that, but I think, you know, there's a time and a place for everything, and this one pleasantly surprised me. I liked it. For me, if it's gonna be silly, I'm gonna need to see some character growth and some, you know, relationship building. And I saw both of those things in this book, so I had a good time. So if you're looking for something like that, pick this up. This next book. I hated. I really hated it. This is up there with In Five Years and One Day in December for me because I just really didn't like it. It was the love proof. And I liked the concept of this book. Our heroine is genius IQ and she is trying to conceptualized time, I think. I, don't, I can't remember exactly what her, you know, thesis or whatever is, but she is trying to do something with time. That, that is her whole thing. And at the beginning of the story, we see her meet a guy and it kind of changes the trajectory of her life and her career. There's so much wrong with this book, but I think my main issue is that the lesson here is that love is everything. Our heroine is so ambitious and not even single-minded. She's just very ambitious and very into what she's studying until she meets this guy. And when she meets him, she completely loses all interest in what she's doing. She makes kind of shitty grades in school. She never turns her life around until he dumps her. He fell in love with her for her smarts is what he says. And he thinks he's holding her back. So he dumps her. He leaves her for many years and then comes back in his fifties and is like, you know what? I can't live without you. And of course she's never found anyone else. And she has gotten back on the horse when it comes to her like, physics or whatever the fuck learning that she's doing. And I just don't know what the point of the story is. Like, is it that love prevails? Is it that you should give up your career for love? It just, it didn't make any sense to me. I hated the way that this was written too. It was so strange because it was about our main character and yet, and yet it was told from the points of view of her mother, her professor, her boyfriend. It almost felt like a documentary, like people talking about you and like the kind of person you are, except for our main character doesn't die in the story. It's just so bizarre. I, d I don't know how to put into words how strange this book is. I don't think I'm doing it justice, but I hated it. And the, the lesson, the moral was a very shitty one, in my opinion. 
Also, um, not that it really matters that much, but the hero in the story is kind of like a money-grubbing Goldman Sachs type, and I didn't like him at all. So, didn't like the hero, didn't like the heroine, not a good story, and there was no, like, true relationship development there. It was insta-love, it was just no, don't pick this up. I didn't rate this, I don't think, but I would give this book one star, so. And then lastly, we have a book that I would say is somewhere in between Much Ado About You and The Love Proof, in that I think it was a little insta-lovey and not the best, but it also was a good book for summer, and that's Float Plan by Trish Dollar. I feel like I've seen a lot of hype around this book. Like, I see it on Instagram quite a bit, and I think maybe that's because they were pushing it really hard in terms of marketing, but really this book is just about our main character, Anne? That doesn't seem right. Anyway, it's about our main character who is sailing her dead fiance's boat because she's grieving his loss and she wants to carry out this like grand sea adventure that he had before he died. It's an interesting story. It does focus a bit on grief, but it's really just about our main character's relationship with Keen. Keen is an Irishman who lost his leg and is having issues trying to get back on a sailing crew because that's like his, his life's dream was to sail. And I think he actually lost his leg in a boating accident, but he decides to free of charge, hop on Anne's boat. I don't think her name is Anne, but for some reason I have it in my notes. Anyway, he hops on her boat, he helps her kind of navigate the waters of the Caribbean, and it's just their love story, I guess. It, love is kind of a loose word here because it's really just an insta-love attraction that they share, but I don't know, it was fine. I was doing yard work while I was listening to this and it had sort of a, I don't know, upbeat tone despite the grief that our heroine's dealing with, and at the end of the book I just felt like a very generic sense of satisfaction. I think this is a very middle of the road story. I think it's a three star for me. I think a lot of people will probably take issue with the insta love and I usually do myself, but I think there was enough time between their initial attraction and their first hookup that it didn't feel too bad for me. I don't know. I, I really do think this is like a, a beach read. It's very descriptive of the Caribbean, so if you're into that, this is something that you might enjoy. But um, Overall, just kind of a middle-of-the-road book in terms of a new release. I wouldn't necessarily say run out and pick it up, but if you can find it at your library, go for it. So that is it. Those are all the books that we've never talked about, the 13 books that we've never talked about. I hope you guys enjoyed this in some way. I do really like filming wrap-ups. I wish the books that I had to talk to you guys about were a little more exciting this time, but I found some other gems that I read in some vlogs these past three months, so I'm not too upset about it, but um, thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know in the comments down below what your favorite books over the past three months were so I can maybe check them out, but I love you guys guys so much and until next time.